Welcome to Off Code, the show where we ignore the cultural codes and have real and intriguing conversations regarding the Black community and ways we can move forward to human flourishing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Off Code. I am Monique Dusan. And I am Kevin Briggins, and we have a great episode for you all today. Uh, first of all, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe as that help us out in the um, in the algorithms to help people find the channel and to find our podcast. Um, but with that said, today is a special uh, episode because for the first time in a while, we actually have a guest on today. And our guest today is Mr. Bob Woodson. And we're going to be talking to him about um, the historic civil rights movement. We're going to talk about you know the issues within the black community, like integration and segregation, and just get the perspective of someone who is kind of seeing the progression from from the end to now and talk about how we can continue to move forward. So I'm looking forward to it. I absolutely cannot wait to have this conversation. I actually saw Mr. Woodson at a conference that my ministry partner, Kristen, and I were recently at in South Carolina, and he said some things there. That I was like, I need to take notes. This is so good. So let's bring on Mr. Woodson. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm delighted to be here and spend some time with you discussing these very important issues. Yes, thank you. I'm looking forward to all that you have to say, all the knowledge that you will drop on us today. Let's start out by just having you tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, I'm Robert L. Woodson Sr., president and founder of the Woodson Center, a not-for-profit uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. that I founded 45 years ago. I am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was born in the, at the end of the, the Depression, 1937. As I said, my, uh, I was the youngest of five children. My dad died when I was nine, even my mother with a fifth grade education and five children to raise. Um, and um, as I said, but uh, what I find interesting that during those early days that uh, in 1937, that I never heard a gunfire. Elderly people could walk safely in their community without fear of being assaulted by their grandchildren. Never heard of a child being shot in the crib. Uh, never heard of uh, groups of young blacks uh, taking over and robbing stores or any of the kind of upheaval that we almost take for granted today. None of that existed in the midst of segregation in the midst of racism. And so I, uh, as I said, the youngest of five, but so it means I had to rely upon my group. I had a group of uh, seven young men who grew up with, uh, they were a year older than me when they finished uh, high school. I was left unaffiliated in an urban neighborhood. So you don't grow up unaffiliated. So at 17, I dropped out of high school and went into the military and saw my first, uh, and I trained in New York and then Mississippi and saw racism in the raw there and was, uh, was airborne electronics in the space program and spent the rest of my time in, in, the, in the Florida uh, at the space program there and uh, finished high school in the military. I got credits at the University of Miami uh, when I couldn't walk on the campus because of segregation. So the Air Force had courses on the base. But afterwards, I got out, uh, worked at a juvenile jail, worked full-time, and went to college full-time, and got involved in the civil rights movement at the age of 25, was leading demonstrations in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and um, it was very, the home of Barrett Rustin. Uh, became very disenchanted after the death of Dr. King, uh, because, and so I left the civil rights movement on the whole issue of busing. I was against forced busing for integration that put me at odds with the other leadership, um, but I was adamantly against it. And, and, uh, and also one other issue that separated me, uh, we led a demonstration outside of a pharmaceutical company. They hired nine black 
PhD chemists, when we asked them to join our movement, they said they got these jobs because they were qualified, not because of the sacrifices of those on the picket lines. So I realized a class issue had emerged, mm -hmm. and those two things sealed it for me. And so after that, I left and worked on behalf of low-income people of all races. Um, that is, that's, that is, yeah, that's that's remarkable. Um, there's a lot there. I mean, you, you laid out a lot. You talk about your involvement in the civil rights movement, and I find it interesting. So I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, so I grew up learning about the civil rights movement and hearing stories. But I don't think I've ever talked about any or talked to anyone from the north. In, in terms of the civil rights movement. And so what made you want to get in the civil rights movement uh, to begin with? What drew you in? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, of course, all of the, the, the demonstrations that were occurring at the time, I mean, segregation was true in this North as well. I mean, we lived, we couldn't go to recreation centers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania either, mm -hmm. the way you could in the South. Uh, there were certain places we were barred from going. Uh, we could go to the movie theaters, but we couldn't go to certain recreational parks in the city. And so we saw the uh, racism. We didn't have many black police officers at the time. Uh, so we, we experienced some of the same um, challenges in, this, in, in the South. And so uh, and our schools were segregated and they were run down. And so... Um, we, we found housing was discrimination in the suburban areas. Blacks couldn't move into certain housing developments, so we had demonstrations against uh, housing, rental restrictions. You couldn't move where you wanted to. I went to the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School and at, in, the, in the 60s, and I couldn't even get on-campus housing, but they never announced it. It's just that they wouldn't rent to me. They said they were filled. So we had a lot to demonstrate against in the North as you did in the South. Wow. One of the things that I don't think people really realize is that segregation was also alive and well in the North. Yes, you know, I don't, I think people think of the South when they think of, you know, redlining and all of the Jim Crow issues and things like that. They think of that. Well, that happened in the South. That wasn't, you know, any place like Philadelphia or things like that. So thank you for that, because that's that's very interesting. Um, and it's super informative to know that it wasn't just in this particular area, but that people were facing race issues around the country. Um, I'm wondering, well, and I know you have heard that, you know, the saying that especially came about in 2020, that America is the most racist that it's been in its inception, you know, or it's the most racist it's been since slavery. In your experience, having, you know, lived through segregation and participated in the civil rights movement, is that something that you see? You know, that is that is just a myth. You mean that the conditions today? Mm -hmm. I'm more racist you, than you they know, just, That's just not true. I mean, they people who say that haven't really lived when people were being lynched. I was in Mississippi when people were being lynched. People are not being lynched today. We we kill more of our own. More blacks are killed by other blacks in one year than killed in 50 years of the Klan. No, I'm sorry. This this is just not true. And it's and it's being it's being uh, promoted by people who really are hustling the race issue. You know, there's a joke that I tell about not a joke really, but a. a but a metaphor, there's a farmer goes to to market and he's got this mule and he gets to a, a crossing in the river uh, in this little creek. And it's it's about three feet high, going about 20 miles an hour. And he forces the mule in and they're both swept a mile down the creek. Then he goes across. A year later, he comes to the same crossing. This time, it's only six inches. And the mule refuses to go across because the mule had good memory, but poor judgment. Mm -hmm. Many of us have good memories, but poor judgments. Conditions are not the way they used to be in, in, in the South. I mean, in, in, uh, in, in the 60s. There have been dramatic changes. We had a black president who was voted a, a, uh, by whites in Utah and all over the country. And so I think people who make that argument use it as a shield so they don't have to confront the ugly questions about 
why are blacks have been failing in their own systems uh if racism were the issue, why are blacks failing in schools run by their own people for the last 20 years? We just heard that Baltimore, Washington, I mean, Baltimore, Maryland, not a single black and single student can pass the basic math exam. That did not happen during segregation in the South or the North. Mm. We had the Rosenwald Booker T schools. There were 5,000 of them. John Lewis and all of them went to we closed the education gap between 1920 and 1940 in the South from three years to six months because of the self-determination that parents had. And they were, were share, the parents of sharecroppers and maids and butlers. But we gave our children a strong sense of personal responsibility, and those kids performed well in those Rosenwald schools. And so the question is, if we could close the education gap between 1920 and 1940 in the South, and, and why can't we do it today? But you see, if you, if you, if you, the way to avoid having to answer that question, oh, it's systemic racism. And that's just a false, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's untrue, and it is, it, is, it is harmful to promote this. That's man. So I, I I agree, um, especially about the idea of it's easier to to scream systemic racism instead of looking in the mirror and facing what the real issues are. In your opinion, in your experience, what do you believe those issues are? What what is what is it that is causing this gap and the issues you quoted, like in Baltimore? What what is the real reasons behind it if it isn't racism? For one thing, I think the breakup of the family, the absence of men in, in the homes. In between 1930 and 1940, during the Depression, there was an unemployment rate was 25% for whites, 40% for black. But we have the highest marriage rate of any group in society. And during that period of economic uh, desperation, our, we were safe. We didn't shoot each other. We didn't engage in a kind of self-destruction. So you can't claim that racism is the cause of this decay. It is when in the 1960s, up until 1965, 85% of all men and women were raising children and in families. We had our Christian faith united us and served as a shield against self-destruction. Today, those values have been undermined by social justice warriors who, uh, who, who, who announce that Christian faith itself is racist, that the nuclear family is Eurocentric and therefore racist. All of the values that enabled blacks to survive slavery and Jim Crow are now under attack by so-called progressives who are doing this in the name of social justice. And we have to push back against that. Do you think that this is an intentional thing? Like, is is the push of social justice onto the black community and the the increase of welfare within the black community, which then in turn increases fatherlessness within the home, is that intentional? And if so, wh like, why would why would that be pushed on the black community? Well, first of all, I think it was when our uh, civil rights leaders became partisan politicians. They abandoned the rich traditions of the civil rights movement when they became partisan politics. Jesse Jackson used to argue that America, black America, cannot find it to the promised land riding the donkey or the elephant, that we have no permanent friends or permanent uh, enemies. We have permanent issues. As soon as he ran for president and became a liberal Democrat, all of his values changed. He then, and, and so a lot of these, uh, once, the, once they became elected mayors of these cities and they began to spend the $22 trillion in poverty programs that the federal government was releasing to these cities where 70 cents of every dollar does not go to the poor, but those who serve the poor, they were able to hire friends and colleagues uh, in the poverty industry 
which created uh, a commodity out of poor people. So they asked not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. Mm -hmm. But in the process of funding all of these agencies, we left the institutions that served us through the end of slavery up until the 60s, the, the, the Masonic organizations, the churches, uh, the, the, the sororities, the fraternities. We had a rich array of institutions within our community that really filled in. They were the ones that created the Rosenwald schools. Julius Rosenwald put up $4 million with the black church and, and black communities. We raised $4.8 million by selling chicken dinners and whatnot. But that whole tradition of self-help, uh, we had our own Wall Streets. We had you know, uh, our, our own banks. We had our own um, uh, colleges. We had a railroad in Baltimore when the blacks got fired in 1868 for striking. We went and, and started our own railroad. It was called a Chesapeake, Maine, Dry Dock, and Railroad Company. For 18 years, we operated our railroad. Our children need to know this, that when we were denied access to hotels, we built our own. The Wallahaji in Atlanta, the, the St. Teresa in New York, the St. Charles in Chicago, the Carver and Calvert hotels in Overtown. I can go on and on and on. Our young people know, you, and they should know, that we had our own economy. We were never dependent on what white people did or did not do. But all of that changed with the poverty programs and us. They actively recruited people on the wel welfare used to be stigmatized in the black community. Wow. So they had to, so they had to end the stigmatization by calling it reparations. Hey. Yeah. Uh, and I can I can s send you to a study done by Cloud and Piven. These were two white socialists uh, uh, social scientists at the University of you know, Columbia University School of Social Work. They, they wrote a paper that said, in order to uh, compel the country to turn to income redistribution, we've got to flood the system, welfare system, with blacks. And so they, you, you, they were, con they, they, uh, there, there was support from the black power movement, unfortunately, who said that the two parent households are Isaac and Harriet, Eurocentric and therefore racist. The women's movement was anti-man, so they, they agreed. So you had a combined force, and then the, uh, the, uh, the government actually opened up offices and then recruited people into the welfare system. So you had 3 million blacks coming into the welfare system in the 70s at a time when the unemployment rate was only 4%. So you have a combination, and what, what the Cloud and Piven predicted was true. If you separate work from income, it'll make fathers redundant, and therefore you can, you'll can see an, uh, 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 school dropouts increase, drug addiction, uh, crime and violence. All of those things would occur, and cities would go bankrupt, and New York City did, in fact, go bankrupt as a consequence of so many people flooding the welfare system. Wow. There, there's so much. There's so much there, and so much I want to get into. Because um, I love the fact that you talk about how we had our own industry, we had our own institutions. We weren't, mm -hmm. you know, dependent on outside and others, and we could do for ourselves. And that is something that the younger generation just don't know. We get told that when we lost Black Wall Street or the the, the Tulsa riots, that we lost everything, as if that affected all of the whole country and all of black America. When you say you were against the forced busing and segregation and desegregation, why, why was that? Why were you against that? Okay. You see, the opposite of segregation, I was on Meet the Press with Jesse Jackson and Johnny Cochran back in 95, I think it was, when this whole question came up. So the... Um, uh, Tim Russell said, well, Mr. Woodson, if you're against 
segregation, that means you're for segregation if you're against integration. I said, no, the opposite of segregation is desegregation. Mm -hmm. Desegregation, the goal is pluralism. Mm -hmm. Integration is an individual matter. But the moment you say, and I don't think we should have argued this a 54, the Supreme Court decision saying that separate is inherently unequal, we should have argued it is strategically unequal. Mm. And the difference wow. is, if you argue it, it's subtle but very profound. If you argue it is, it, it is inherently unequal, you're saying anything that's all black is all bad. Mm. And I remember um, I was debating this with Julius Chambers. He was a black Harvard trained lawyer and head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. We did this before the New York Bar Association. And I said, Julius, midway through the debate, I said, we have two circumstances. Search your path A, you have a all black school where there's a presence of educational excellence. School B, is integrated where there's diminished excellence. Where should we send our children? He said, to school B. I said, then if that's what you believe, we have nothing to debate. Mm. Because I really think you should do like what Marva Collins did, the East Side Academy in Chicago. If you create a center of excellence, people will seek you out, and then integration will be a byproduct of, of excellence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellence. Yes. But, the, oh. but, you, but your listeners should also know that in five cities, New York, Baltimore, Washington, Atlanta, and New Orleans, at the turn of the century, there were five black high schools. And they had overcrowded classrooms, used textbooks, and half the budgets of white schools. Every one of them tested higher than any white school in those cities. See, our young people need to know this. And the it, question it is, is mm -hmm. that those same schools, Dunbar in, in Baltimore today, not one child in the whole system. That, so we need to sit and ask ourselves, how could we have achieved that in the midst of segregation? And we can't, that's something that we ought to be debating and yeah. we ought to be researching and we ought to be discussing and talking about that. Yeah, I, I agree. Why do you think we we don't or aren't allowed to? Why can't we bring these things up and have public discussions on this? Because the people, mayors, and other civil rights leaders who have been in charge of these cities for 50 years, they do not want this kind of discussion to occur because people will ask, well, what have you been doing for 50 years? Mm. You have to ask you yourself, look at the, look at where the, where is the, sons and daughters of the teachers, where do their children go? They do not go to those kind of schools. And the question is, where do the sons and daughters of civil rights leaders go? They go to Sidwell Friends School. Jesse Jackson's son went there. Eleanor Holmes Norton's kid went there. Frank Smith, the superintendent of schools, his daughter goes to Sidwell Friends. While at the same time, they are against a uh, school choice for poor families. Just like everybody's for defending the defunding the police, except mm -hmm. their own personal security guards. If you if you're for defunding the police, then I want you to refuse to accept capital police protection for you. So you need to demonstrate by your actions your commitment to the same thing you're saying that poor blacks ought to endure. Yep, they're not gonna do that because they they wheels will get stolen off their car. Oh, uh, <laughs> so do you think that this conversation, um, in like places like Philadelphia, a Detroit, and Atlanta, places where blacks at one point, you know, like the turn of the century, were doing very, very well, we look at those places today, and it's just, it's, I'm just gonna say it's a mess to be polite. Um, <laughs> do you think that it's part of the the poverty institution? Or like looking at the poor or poor blacks as a commodity. And so it's like, I need to keep these poor blacks in my area, in my district, so that I can stay 
in power. So I would rather give them welfare than give them freedom. Absolutely. In other words, it, they're willing to sacrifice uh, black bodies for black votes. Mm. <laughs> as long as, but see, the, the greatest deterrent to voting isn't the restrictions of laws. It is apathy. You go into these cities and look at and those low-income, high-crime areas, less than 5 to 10% of people even vote in the mayor's election. Mm-hmm. But no one looks at that. It's because they feel it's hopeless. There's no point in voting because we don't have a real choice. As long as you can keep the people sedated on racism, they're not going to wake up and realize that their pockets are being picked. Wow. Sedated on racism. That that's a strong word. That is a strong word. You know, I want to I want to hit number I mean that I, that just I feel like you know I need to take a break and we just go to lunch or something at that point. <laughs> so, you know, say, so, but I, that's real talk, and I don't. But nobody's really talking real talk. At least, no. I feel like not a lot of people in my generation are wanting to talk that real talk. Like you sedated on racism every four years or so, when a black person get killed during an election cycle everybody's up in arms and you know and then you vote a certain way or as soon as as soon as the conversation of race even comes up you're all in your emotions and then you vote a certain way but the way that you vote continues to keep you enslaved to the things that you say you hate and one of the ways that you can you can't do anything angry that's useful to you at all you can't make love you can't eat you can't sleep you can't make a, a responsible argument. There's nothing. But as long as you can keep black folks into a state of agitation and, and a state of fear that somehow their destiny is determined by what white people do. And therefore, if you, well, no white people are present. Well, it's systemic. Mm-hmm. Well, what does that mean? Tell me, I was on with Hawk Newman and debating him on these issues for, for who head of Black Lives Matter in New York, a uh, very young lawyer there. And so we have a spirited debate on this issue, but I didn't, he didn't bait, I didn't make him confront my arguments. I made him confront the facts. And I'm going to tell me if we are running the police departments, the healthcare system, the foster care system, the school system, and our kids are failing in those systems, tell me why. How, how can you blame racism if we are the ones running? Well, systemic racism. If you believe that white people have the power to compel us to make uh, uh, destructive decisions about our people, you believe in white power. Mm. You believe in white supremacy. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've made those same arguments. Like I say, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm 42 years old. In my entire life, we've had a black mayor black police chief, black city council, black school board superintendent, everything has been black. And yet at the same time, we can cry about racism is why we're being held back. We control everything. Um, so. And so am I all about it too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and that mayor got shut down when he says race is not the greatest issue. It's, 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 it's systemic incompetence. Yes. And systemic corruption that is the biggest barrier to flourishing of low-income people. It is. It is. Hey, family. I wanted to take a minute and talk to you about Birmingham Theological Seminary. It's my seminary, and it's a place that I extremely appreciate. They have small class sizes, very reasonable tuition, and professors who are committed to your education and to my education. If you are looking to extend your theological education and are considering seminary, I encourage you to check out Birmingham Theological Seminary. You can go to bts.education for more information. When you talk about the civil rights movement and we talk about integration, In terms of us having our own as we used to, because we basically segregation forced us to, right? I mean, we had the difference. Right. Is, is integration the reason we kind of lost it all? 
there are several factors. One, we we left our own institute. I can show you examples right here in, in where I live in Maryland, where right in the 60s, there were, uh, now I'll give you an example. In 1973 in Boston, Judge Garrity was faced with a decision whether or not to push for force busing or strengthen neighborhood schools. So for four months, he asked the black community an answer to that question. They had town meetings all over the low income community. They came up and said, we want to you to spend more per capita on our schools and give us the means to improve our schools. The civil rights leaders and the liberal lawyers, black lawyers at Harvard told Judge Garrity the heck with what they want, bust them, even though none of those civil rights leaders had their children mm -hmm. on those buses. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up busing black children from a superior black high school into an inferior white high school. And one, and there was a lot of violence, and one white mother said on the press, yeah, bust them in here, they'll graduate as dumb as our children. Mm -hmm. wow. We had the same thing in Prince George's County, Maryland where we hired two young, very aggressive black principals who had parents come in even on the weekends and at night studying, and test scores began to soar. But the NAACP and the Urban League came in and said, no, bust them. So okay. busing became more important than educational excellence, and that's the dangers of embracing integration as opposed to desegregation with the goal of competence should, should determine uh, outcomes. Yeah, I get it. I get your point now about if that's your view, then you have to view anything that is all black as less than, as inferior, because otherwise you're, you're viewing that we must be integrated with the white schools and the white institutions, otherwise we're less than. Um, Absolutely. We used to say, yeah, white white ice is colder than black ice. Mm. <laughs> 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 so, so, right, the people who argue for that would claim to be against white supremacy, but clearly they're the ones who believe it. Absolutely. They are. But again, it's the hypocrisy, but they have their own children in competent white schools, mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'm sorry. During that time, what was the, was, was the main push for integration just so that there would be desegregation so that we could share the same space? I'm wondering what would put someone in the position of saying, instead of strengthening the school that we're in, the school that's already doing well, let's sacrifice these kids. And I mean, it's not my own because I'm in a place of leadership. Let's just, you know, forget about the school that's doing well in exchange for integration. Now, some of it, re the reality is that some of the physical plants of our schools were poor than white schools. And so, so they looked at what to, to, we didn't have science labs, libraries, and things like that in some of the black schools. And so you look at the white schools, they had science labs and all that stuff. So there was a, a, a reasonable understanding why people would want it. In some cases, and I'm not saying it should be absolute, in some cases that was a good decision. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we should have started by integrating the teachers first mm -hmm. instead of starting with the students because thousands of good black teachers lost their jobs in, 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 in integration. They fired mo a lot of the black teachers that used to live in the communities where they taught, even in the homes of, and they were, so we lost a whole a generation of competent black teachers at doing this changeover. So you're not saying that integration itself throw the baby out with the babbler, all of it was horrible, but that we should have yeah. taken def a, a more nuanced look at what we were maybe given. Exactly. Us. That's my point. I'm not saying that on every case that the black schools should not have been done away with. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, as you say, we should be more nuanced about it. 
in other words, when uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania graduate school uh, in 1962, and I had just married and was looking for on-campus housing, and I couldn't get it because of, they never said it, but a white couple went in right after I was denied, and they offered them housing, and they came and told me. And so we had that at, at, even at the unit, but, and they wouldn't let Jews and blacks in. So when desegregation came, Jews came in and integrated the way the blacks did, but Jews did not leave Yeshiva and Brandeis. They, they, didn't, they didn't abandon Brandeis for Penn and Harvard. They maintained Brandeis and they maintained Yeshiva. And so they wanted both and. In many cases, we abandoned our institutions. Yeah. Our businesses, we abandoned. We had country clubs. Uh, we, we had all kinds of uh, hotels. We had our own system. I, I can go, every city had a grand hotel. The Carver and Calvert hotels in Overtown. But what happened was Freeways came right on through all those communities, and so our commercial section, urban renewal did more to destroy black in, uh, commercial enterprise than anything the Klan could have ever done. Mm -hmm. And but and 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 urban renewal was they recruited black politicians to support urban renewal, even though it was opposed by our business community. So you had a conflict between. Black elected officials advocating for urban renewal at a time when black businesses were against it. Do you think that, it, do you think looking at the black community today that we would be in a better place or have a better setup if things like um, integration wouldn't have gone as full steam ahead and maybe we would have just started out simply with desegregation. Yeah, we would have been much further along right now where we've maintained our institutions uh, and, um, and but also the moral base too. The very fact that I saw something two years ago that just blew my mind that is symbolic of how far down we've come. There was a white woman with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on, walking up, physically beating a black mother who was at a Trump parade, and she was pushing her two-year-old in a stroller, and this woman with a Black Lives Matter was beating this black mother, and there was, and people stopped it, but there was no outcry from the black community, mm -hmm. from the so-called leadership. To me, that that says it all about how far we have abandoned our own principles in the name of race mm -hmm. and, and and politics. That that symbol of a white woman with black lives on a beating a black mother, pushing a baby and so because she's in a Trump rally. Yeah. And right. and there's no outcry that our black leadership um allowed trans and every other group to come in and appropriate the suffering that we went. They never, well, gays and all these other people never wore the crown of thorns of slavery and Jim Crow. They have no right to come in and claim parity with our suffering. But what they've yes. done is taken our suffering and appropriated and said, black and queer studies. No. Yes. There is Isn't no it? equivalent there. But our so-called leadership are sitting by passively allowing themselves to be exploited like that and allow this rich legacy to be ripped apart and, and, and stolen and misappropriated. Yeah, you, you talked about it. You hit on it earlier when you talked about how once they realized that essentially black leaders became successful when they became politically partisan, right? Right. It is almost at any cost. Because, as you just pointed out, it seems to be way more ideological than, right. than anything else. They're willing to toe the line 
of a particular political party and grab on to any ideology that political party chooses to push, no matter what it means for the black community. They're, they're being led by the nose. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation takes in about $60 million a year from corporations, and they're able to contract with their sons and daughters, and, and, and they, it's, 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 it's an appointment for life. Mm -hmm. and, and so they, they are living in that bubble. And, and as long as they keep black America aggrieved, that, so right now, the Black Caucus and the NAACP, to me, have abandoned all pretense of being pro-black. When Catholic charities in uh, Massachusetts and in Illinois refuse to place black, I mean, adoptive children in same-sex homes, a lawsuit they filed a lawsuit, the NAACP Urban Loot jo joined as an amicus to that lawsuit. And so as a consequence, those Catholic charities shut down after operating 100 years, which means that thousands of black children are not going to find adoptive homes. But the NAACP the Urban League didn't offer to find any homes for those. Even, even though there are adoption agencies who do place children in same-sex homes, so they could have gone there. But the NAACP abandoned the, the interests of the black community to appease the interests of these other groups. But you see, we don't discuss these kinds of things. No, we don't. We don't. We do on this podcast. This this okay. all no, we 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 talk about it all because it needs to be talked about. Um I want people to understand too, you know, you founded the Woodson Center and you've done a lot of work with impoverished communities. Um, you've been on the ground. You, you've you seen it firsthand. What do you think are the actual solutions? How do we how do we move forward? Or how do we get okay. everyone's hand? Uh, first of all, there's if you say that 70% of families in these low-income communities are raising children that are dysfunctional, it means 30% are not. We go into those low-income, high-crime neighborhoods, and we go into the households of the children who are being raised that are not dropping out of school or in jail and drugs, and then we study what they are doing right and then try to help them adopt that to the 70% of doing it the wrong way. There are also churches and, and institutions within these communities that are practicing some of the old values. Uh, Pastor Buster Soares and uh, First Baptist Church of Somerset, New Jersey, uh, uh, near uh, in, in Somerset, um, he his church instead of rebuilt their structure and they set up an economic development program. And in 20 years, they took over that community, drove out the drug dealers, uh, started businesses, a new uh, uh, and, and this became a, a center for development of that whole community. So they they revitalized it without gentrification. And there are other examples where uh, civic local leaders, we had a, a, a group that we helped 25 years ago called Benning Terrace in Washington, D.C. There was public housing development. There were 53 murders in a five square block area in two years because of the war in factions. I su we supported a group called the Alliance of Concerned Men. These are five Christian men who were ex-offenders who had social trust and moral authority. They went into this community at our direction and brought warring factions to the Woodson Center's office. We negotiated a peace treaty. We didn't have violence for 12 years there. And these same young men who were terrorized in the communities became ambassadors of peace. And they worked to help restore and rebuild that community. And many of them have married and are raising children today. So we are, there are models of moral and spiritual and economic restoration, and, and they exist all over the country. Uh, we just, where they're applying old values to this new vision, but we've got to shift resources so we begin to uh, what, uh, do that. What Pastor Tommy Quick is doing um, yes. is, 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 is really promoting restoration and moral um, revitalization 
But it begins with a moral restoration. It begins with character change, character restoration. We're hoping to get um, Tommy Quick on the on our podcast. He is the or one of the leaders, the founder of um, Christian Families Against Destructive Destructive Decisions. decisions. Mm-hmm. CFAD. And it's a conference. He had a conference that Krista and I went to last month. Phenomenal organization. But um, I want to go back to some of what you were saying about resilience and trust and all of that. You're actually lifting principles from your book, Lessons from the Least of These. And one, I just want to, you know, we'll have it in the in the comments or in the show notes area where you can actually go and order this book and um, read the lessons from the least of these by Mr. Woodson. It looks at 10 principles um, for just community excellence, for getting back into the black community and helping to uplift the community, helping people to um, not just, not just take a hand out, but to look at what they are capable of doing for themselves. It looks at things like agency and resilience, integrity, trust, these are all important principles for uplifting a community that um, that's really been done very wrong by its own leaders. And so I just wanted to make sure that we talked about those principles and um, let people know that you are actually referring to and have written down these principles and other people can take your book and look at the things that are needed. These are principles that have been replicated through the Woodson Center and you know people are walking these things out on the daily so thank you for that because as I was listening to it even this morning I was like you know that it again it's so true when you look at agency people shouldn't just be receiving you know a hand out but being able to work we can't decouple work from you know humanity or human agency or poverty or things like that oh, you really got it I need to take you uh on road with me. You let me know. Okay. You let me know. Because I'm no, here for you. But, but I really and I really appreciate you inviting me on because we don't talk about this enough. That people are motivated when you show them victories that are possible, not always reminding them of of, of injuries to be avoided. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, yes. so that's why at our conferences, and I commend this to any of your, your your viewers, when you have a conference, do not let anyone ask a question or state a problem unless they have a solution. Mm. It doesn't have to be the solution, but it has to be a solution. And believe me, if you practice that, you'll save a lot of time from people who just want to come and whine and complain about how bad life is. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that I appreciate, and I know this is completely off, um, I took us on a different road bringing up the book, but one of the things that I appreciate is that you say when you go into some of these communities, one, don't look at these people as like just, you know, victims in this, you know, poor impoverished neighborhood, but look at these people who are living in this community as people of possibility. And then when you talk about that 30% that you mentioned earlier, if 70% are the people who are in, you know, dire need or who might be living in ways counter to true success. Look at that 30% and see them. So so study the people who might be in the situation, but not necessarily of the situation. So I might be in this community, but I'm not of this community. And that is a mental shift. That talks about agency. That talks about how I have um, orientated my life and how I'm going to live and what I'm going to pass down to my children. What's my, my legacy going to be? So I was, yeah, just super appreciative of that. As we get ready to wrap up, I do have um, a couple more questions. And Kevin, I want to make sure that you get all your questions in too. I'm going to start and then I'll pass it off to you. Um, right, go ahead. If Mr. Woodson ran the civil rights movement, what would you have changed or done different like what are what what would the agenda have been that you would have put forward? You know, no one's ever asked me that. It's one of the best questions that I've ever had. <laughs> I'm telling you, we can go on the road. We can do this. We can do, we can do no, it really is, but it is a challenging question. And I'll just give you the short answer. For one, I would not have emphasized I would have pushed back against the poverty program. 
I, I would have rejected it. I would have said that it's harmful. I would have also um, embraced our entrepreneurs to say, I would look back about how we built our, the, our black uh, Wall Street, and I would have welcomed going back into the future and brought forward an, an economic agenda to talk about any group in societies is determined by their small business formation rate. <clears throat> and so I would have placed an emphasis on bringing people with capital together with entrepreneurs, and we would have uh, seeded our whole country and black neighborhoods with, um, with this entrepreneurial spirit. But I've also, if, if people taught con uh, control of the schools, I would have been opposed to, I, I would have promoted desegregation and not integration, I would have would would have raised money to strengthen the neighborhood schools and create centers of excellence where black was and let integration flow from the pursuit of excellence. Wow. That yeah, that be thank you. Thank you very much. I um I, I appreciate that. It gives me a lot to think about when I think back about integration and the civil rights movement and what could have been done differently. And especially like the, the black, the black agenda, like if we would have had a, maybe a different agenda, then would our agenda today be different? And what is the agenda today? And who's, um, who is enforcing that black agenda and keeping us on a trajectory to have a better tomorrow? But that, that agenda has to be written and started today. And also, there's no debate. We used to have a rigorous debate in the black. There is no debate today. You're either liberal, uh, progressive, or you're, you're nothing. But back in the civil rights movement, it was the young students at Birmingham that supported King, not the older leadership. Yes. Because the students and, and you young, younger generations pushed the uh, old guys because that, that sit-in at Greensboro was opposed by the civil rights leadership. So King was sent to, to stop it. And the kids said, lead, follow, or get out the way. And when he went to Birmingham, the, the, pre the preachers and the civil rights people opposed King coming in, but it was the young students who came to King and rallied him and forced the adults to join the movement. So we don't have that tension. You have SNCC, uh, SCLC, Progressive Baptist, all those are splintering of the civil rights movement, uh, the, the Black Power movement, the Nation of Islam, all of these splinterings were a result of rigorous debate. There's no debate today. You just do what liberal white folks tell them to do. <laughs> um, you, I guess you, you've done a lot of work with poverty, and you, re you said something earlier about um, focus on issues of poverty amongst all people. Um, one thing I've always felt is that a lot of the issues of the poor black community get used in, in, in this race war when they're really just issues of poverty in general. That's right. Um, what, what are some of those issues you've seen across just poverty of all races? What are some of those issues that we need to address, not just in the black community, but just poverty as, as a whole? First of all, the, the crisis that we're facing is a moral and spiritual crisis, uh, and it's causing its free fall. That's why the highest, the, the, the highest mortality rate caused in the black community is homicide. It is suicide in upper-income white communities like Silicon Valley, where the teen suicide rate is six times the national average. And the highest rate among low-income whites is prescription drugs. So what we have done is we brought together mothers who have lost children in each of those three categories and what we call a mother's consortium, where for three days we came together, those moms, to share what is it that we have in common and how can we unify around an agenda to help fill that hole in the, in the hearts of our children that's causing them to devalue human life. If you devalue human life, you'll either take your own or take someone else's. But that is something we can solve together if we can come together and put race out of the way and stop people on both the left and the right who are race grievance merchants who prosper as a result of us being with these differences. Uh, I, I, I agree. I agree. Um, as we close and we, get, and we wrap up, 
you talk about we have a moral and spiritual crisis. How do, how do we overcome that crisis? What is what is the solution? How do we get back to those morals and values we once had? Well, I'm Christ-centered, so my my, my, my answer is, is simple. I just think we've got to return back to our faith. Yeah, amen. And, and, and pray that, that, that he can deliver all of us, even non-believers. Yes. But I think those of us who are believers have to get, stand up and assert these values and, and, and be unapologetic about that. But again, uh, I read the, the reason that I believe that we must do it not by offering superior arguments. We must do it the way Christ did it. When the servants of John the Baptist came to him and said, are you the one or should we seek another? He didn't say, wasn't I born on Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> No, he didn't pull out his resume. He healed in their presence and said, go tell them what you saw. What we do at the Woodson Center is we let the evidence of our grassroots leaders who are redeeming and restoring people from drugs, from predatory behavior, overcoming the, the pain of losing a child to violence, we're, we're helping them to become redeemed and restored uh, and so our first chore is to support those so that we can redeem individuals, but also redeem whole communities. But we must be on the right path to that. We must know where the solution is, and it's in the Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Woodson, for hanging out with us for this hour. We so appreciate it. This has been good for real. I mean, if I was in black church and I had a fan, I'd fan you. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to tell, tell you that this is, uh, I think, one of the most exciting interviews that I've had. And I'm saying that uh, in, with sincerity. Um, and so I'm delighted that you gave me an opportunity to share my heart on these issues. So I, I, I thank you. Well, Mr. Woodson, I want to say you have an open invitation to come back anytime you want. So <laughs> just reach out and we'll make a way. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. You have a good day. All right. You guys, check out um, Mr. Woodson's work at the Woodson Center. You can go to Woodson Center, W-O-O-D. Yeah, just two O's, W-O-O-D, center.org. Check out the work that he's doing and the people that he is affiliated with and the work that they're doing in grassroots organizations around the country. Man, that was a blessing. That how do you defend you kind of, like you you still defend the ad we would call it the afterglow in black Earth. <laughs> you and the afterglow. I mean like me and like Mr. Woodson, I can sit around all day and talk to and just hear their stories. Uh yeah. and, and, and glean their wisdom which we mm -hmm. don't do enough of. We don't glean that yes. of our elders. And yes. so I'm just appreciative of you know, the work that he, he's done his whole life and how he continues to speak out on these issues. I just wish that more people were aware of who he was and the work that he does and his voice and his reach. Uh, but there's a reason that people don't want his voice out there and the things he's saying. I mean, he, he, he talked about it. Too yep. many people are benefiting off of kind of that narrative, that race hustling narrative to actually have real debates and discussions about the real issues. Um, that is so true. Yeah. Also, and, you know, he, and so in those major institutions, in those black institutions that he cares a lot about, they don't want to hear his voice. They don't yeah. want him to be heard because he's going to mess up their good thing they've got going, which is their grievance. Yeah. Right. And so, um, yeah, I just, I hope this interview goes viral. That's all I can say. Yeah, it, you know, it, it makes you wonder, like, when, when people become a commodity, mm -hmm. those who buy and sell will do whatever it takes to keep the business open. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, you guys, with that, thank you so much for joining us, for hanging out. Check out 
bobwoodsoncenter.org and find out more about Bob Woodson. Also, check us out at the Center for Biblical Unity. You can go to centerforbiblicalunity.com and check us out. You can also sign up for our digital weekly newsletter. We will send you updates from our ministry on Sunday afternoon. God bless and have a good day.